Hi, I'm Conor Houghton. This is lecture 14 in the uh, probability and combinatorics section of our unit Mathematics for Computer Science A. Uh, this lecture will be about the Poisson distribution. So we'll start our discussion of uh, the Poisson distribution uh, with an example or a story. The idea is you have a lake and the lake has some water in it and in the water there are plenty and plenty of fish. And as a consequence you have a, a fisherman person Fish person here is on some sort of uh, jetty. That's not important, obviously. But they're sitting on the jetty, and they're holding out their rod, and they're 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 fishing. Uh, they're running a cap too. They're they're fishing uh, for fish. Uh, say they fish uh, every day from you know, one to three, and in a typical day, or on average, they'll catch five fish. And we'd like to know what the probability is that they catch exactly four. And that's the situation uh, that's uh, that may be modelled. In certain circumstances by uh, the Poisson uh, distribution. Uh, that assumes that this is a Poisson process and uh, for it to be a Poisson process it, there's, there's really uh, two aspects. One is that it's temporally homogeneous. Uh, in other words uh, during the time that they spend fishing uh, the, the conditions don't change. The, uh, this lambda equals five is the same every day they go. So obviously that's not going to be true. Sometimes the year will be better than others. Um, some days there, there might be rain, uh, some days there might be sun, and that will change the uh, expected uh, number of fish. That's not included in this homogeneous assumption. The homogeneous assumption is an assumption about the homogeneity of the process uh, in time. You can uh, study an inhomogeneous uh, Poisson process, um, but uh, we're not doing that uh, here. The second thing is this Poisson assumption, and that's really about the uh, probability of catching a fish in any given moment. So you have some tiny amount of time and you're asking how likely is the angler to catch a fish. Uh, we're assuming that that probability doesn't depend on the history of fish catching. So you might imagine that if the angler catches a lot of fish or, or certainly if they catches a lot of fish in one area there won't be so many fish there the other fish will be somewhere else or maybe when the angler catches a fish the thrashing around the fish might um, during the process of reading it in uh, might put the other fish off or scare them away and so the probability of catching a fish now will depend on how recently the previous fish was caught. That is not modelled by a Poisson process. The assumption that a Poisson process makes is that the, uh, the probability of catching a fish is homogeneous in time, it doesn't depend on the time and it doesn't depend on the history of uh, fish catching. It only depends, uh, well the only thing that matters is you have your, your hook in the water and you have some probability in any given moment of, of catching a fish. So uh, how, how do we model that? In fact, what's done uh, it, uh, in fact, what's done to, to derive the uh, Poisson distribution, that is the probability distribution that goes with the Poisson process, the probability distribution that you'll catch a given number of fish, uh, calculating that distribution, it can be done from the binomial distribution we discussed in, in the last lecture. Uh, that It involves uh, a slightly uh, tricky limit uh, we're not going to worry too much about the, the mathematics of that limit, proving a convergence, etc. But uh, looking at the limit and looking at the derivation, I think, tells us a lot about how it, it actually works. And how it works is this. We have, um, we have uh, our, uh, our time here. This is the time, we'll call this big T, that the angler spends fishing. And we're going to divide T up into, into little bits. In fact, we're going to divide it up into N little time slots. And we're going to um, approximate the, the, the uh, process by saying that the probability in each uh, time slot of catching one fish is p, of catching no fish is, is 1 minus p, and there's no chance of catching two fishes. In other words, we've divided time up into little time slots. Each of these is going to be delta t long, where delta t is equal to big T over n. And as I just said, the assumption is that the probability of catching uh, one fish, no, sorry, the probability uh, for a given uh, slot is equal to one, uh, the probability of that you'll catch one fish, that's uh, right, it's p for the probability of catching one fish, uh, one minus p for the probability of catching zero fishes, and um, zero for a uh, greater than one fish. Um, obviously, if there's a chance um, p of catching one fish, there should be uh, some probability of catching two fishes. But uh, this here, uh, this binomial type 
probability distribution, where in each slot you have a probability p of catching one fish, but no chance of catching two. That's uh, an approximation uh, to the Poisson process, which is about there being a continuous and fixed uh, probability of, of catching fish. Uh, so this distribution is approximating the one that we're interested in. In fact, um, the two become the same in the limit where n goes to infinity, or the little time slot becomes uh, infinitely narrow. You can see why that would be. It's because um, the probability of catching two fish in a given time slot goes to zero faster than the probability of catching one fish. So what I'm saying is we're approximating the process, the Poisson process, by this binomial type distribution where we've divided time into little slots, and we've made this assumption uh, that there's no chance of catching two fishes, so we're only dealing with the chance of catching one fish in a given time slot, or, or, or none. And you can see that this is, is like the binomial distribution. And what I'm claiming is that this is a good approximation uh, to the Poisson process as, uh, as n goes to infinity. Uh, if you included a term for the probability of catching a second fish, you'd see that that wouldn't matter in the limit. We're not going to go through that, I just hope you think it, it's plausible. Now, uh, here we are, we have this, uh, we've divided time up into n little slots, and we're going to ask, what's the probability of catching uh, our fishes? And this distribution is kind of an approximation to the Poisson process that we're dealing with. So I'm going to call the random variable r tilde. It's going to be approximation to the random variable r, which is the thing we're actually interested in, which is the uh, number of fish caught uh, during the period. So according to our tilde, there's uh, n slots. Each slot has a chance p of success. We're asking for r successes. Uh, and so then we'll have uh, n minus r failures. This is just the uh, binomial expansion. And we have to choose the uh, r slots in which we catch the, uh, catch the fish out of the n possible slots there are. So in this approximation where we've divided up time, uh, the probability of catching r fishes is n choose r, p to the r, 1 minus p to the n minus r. And uh, p, as I said, is the chance of catching, catching a fish in one of these time slots. And p remains constant and doesn't depend on where the other uh, catching events are, exactly because of this assumption that we're dealing with an inhomogeneous Poisson process. So what we want to do is we want to take the limit of this as... Uh, the number of, of slots as n goes to infinity, that's the limit where this binomial approximation to the Poisson process becomes a, pro a Poisson process. So we want n to go to infinity. And clearly, that's going to be a small bit tricky. Um, well, first of all, we're going to have to choose the, take the n approach to infinity limit of complicated things like the factorial uh, and this object here. And secondly, and more immediately, uh, we have the objection that this p is clearly going to zero as n goes to infinity. Uh, and uh, we need to actually sort of think about the speed that p goes to um, goes to zero. Uh, obviously, the shorter the time slot, uh, the, the smaller p. In fact, for the same situation, if you have the time slot, you'd expect to have a p. If you divided the time slot into quarters, you'd expect to have to divide p into quarters. And in that way, we think that p, or we imagine that p uh, goes like um, uh, 1 over n. The bigger n is, the smaller p is. So in fact, what we're going to do is we're not going to deal with p. We're going to deal with some quantity we'll call um, the lambda. And lambda is equal to p times n. And the hope is uh, that if we deal with this lambda, we'll end up with something that uh, remains finite uh, or well-defined as n goes to infinity. So what I'm saying is, instead of uh, writing uh, p here, we're going to write lambda is equal to p times n, and we're assuming that uh, lambda doesn't depend on n, because p clearly does. Okay, so if lambda is equal to p times n, then p is equal to lambda over n. I'll just copy uh, what we need onto the next piece of paper. So we have that um, p r of r is equal to uh, n choose r, uh, lambda over n to the power of r, 1 minus lambda over n to the power of n minus r, uh, where lambda is equal to p times n. So the next thing we're going to do is we'll deal with this, uh, this factorial term here. So n choose r is equal to n factorial over r factorial n minus r factorial. Uh, so that's 1 over r factorial. And then the, the important thing here is that we end up with r terms. So this looks like, after you've cancelled the lower term from the top term, this looks like r 
multiply uh, n, multiply by n minus 1, multiply by n minus 2, blah, 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 multiply by n minus r plus 1. And there's r terms here. So if we multiply this whole thing out, it would look like uh, 1 over r factorial by n to the power of r, that n by that n by that n by blah, 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 plus then uh, some number, doesn't matter what. Um, so uh, we'll put, you know, a times n to the r minus 1 plus b times n to the r minus 2, blah, 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 blah. And so this, this quantity here is a, is a polynomial uh, in n, uh, but all the terms are, are going to have a lower power uh, compared to the n. And so as uh, n approaches infinity, this is always going to dominate over these, because however big a is, uh, the extra n in the n to the r uh, will be bigger. So as, uh, as n goes to infinity, this will look like 1 over r factorial uh, n to the r. And what we're doing is we're basically dropping the uh, terms that look like n to the r minus 1 and less. Well, that's convenient, because if you look at that n to the r there, that clearly cancels with that n to the r here. So the idea might be now that we think that p of r uh, goes like, as n becomes very large, uh, a lambda to the r over... Uh, r factorial multiplied by 1 minus uh, lambda over n to the n divided by 1 minus lambda to the n over r. And all I've done there is I've split that fraction up. And the reason I'm going to have done that is, well, the two fate of those two terms is quite different. The limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over lambda over n to the r, well, the r power of r there doesn't make any difference. We just have something divided by n. The lambda is finite. So as the n becomes very large, that thing becomes very small, and we just end up with 1 to the r, which is 1. So the uh, denominator in that uh, term there uh, is, uh, is just 1. It's not important. The numerator is a little bit more complicated. So we have 1 minus lambda over n uh, all to the power of n. And that thing, uh, that's, uh, that's equal to e to the minus lambda. In fact, that's uh, one of the uh, approaches that people use when first defining uh, the exponential. So there's lots of uh, different ways that people define the exponential. They say the, the exponential is defined by um, d dx of e to the x is equal to e to the x, and e to the 0 is equal to 1. That's one definition. Another definition is e to the x is defined by its Taylor expansion, by its power series. So it's equal to um, r equals 0 to infinity, uh, x to the r over r factorial. Uh, but a third definition that you often see yeah, is, is this one here. And it's uh, often justified or explained in terms of the uh, free, infinitely frequent compounding. So the story is that, uh, 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 is that if you have uh, money in a bank and um, you have interest on the money, well then, you know, after a year, the, your interest is calculated and that increases your principal. But if instead um, they gave you half the interest rate, but, it, but calculated it every six months, you'd end up with slightly more money because the interest that you were awarded after six months would then go on and earn interest for the remaining six months. And then you go further. If you get your interest every, every three months, you know, you now would be getting a quarter of the interest rate, but you'd be paid quarterly. You'd get slightly more again because, um, because again, your, uh, uh, the interest you earn after three months will earn money for the remaining uh, nine months, the interest that you get after nine months, uh, you wouldn't have got till the end of the year, but now it earns three months worth of interest. So the uh, the more frequently uh, the, that your compound interest is awarded to you, uh, the faster your, your your principal grows. And the limit of that process where you're being awarded your interest continuously, that's the limit of infinite compounding. It's modeled by an exponential, and basically it's equivalent to this for formula here. I mean, often when it's stated, you're looking at a, a, a positive lamb, uh, plus something rather than minus something, but it's the same formula. So I'm not uh, proving this, uh, although I've just given a description of it, but I am pointing out that this is um, commonly uh, a formula that is given when discussing the exponential or motivating the exponential, and you, you've probably seen it before. And so what that means when we put all of that together is that we started off um, with P of R tilde uh, r, we started off by saying that was equal to n choose r um, lambda over n to the power of r, 1 minus uh, lambda over n uh, to the n minus r, and we're saying that that approaches as uh, n goes to infinity, pr of r equals 
um, uh, lambda to the r over r factorial e to the minus lambda. And that, in fact, is the uh, Poisson distribution. So p r of r is equal to lambda the r over r factorial e to the minus lambda gives the probability uh, that during the Poisson process, if the average number of events is lambda, it gives the probability that you'll get uh, exactly r events. Um, and it's one of the classic and important uh, discrete probability distributions. Uh, you might uh, think, well, that, that doesn't look right because it, it's hard to imagine that the sum of uh, over r is equal to uh, 1, uh, but in fact we can uh, show that very easily. So if we let z equals the sum from r equals 0 to infinity, so z again as always is equal to the sum uh, p of r, summed over all the possible values of r, um, and you know, in principle, although the probability has become very small, you can get any value of r. It's not like some of the other distributions we've been looking at, uh, limited to a set range. But if we sum over all the possible values of r, uh, we should get 1. And if we look here, so I've substituted in for p r of r, I've dropped the tilde now because this is the Poisson distribution, not a binomial uh, expansion, a uh, binomial um, approximation to it. Well, I can take the e to the minus lambda outside, and then I get lambda to the r over r factorial, r equals 0 to infinity. And that thing, uh, as we just discussed, uh, is the Taylor expansion of the exponential, is e to the lambda. And so we get e to the minus lambda by e to the lambda, and that's equal to 1. So that's cool. Um, you know, it has to have happened if the calculation is correct, but it's nice to see it working because the calculation was quite a difficult one, and it gives us some assurance, or at least some hope, that the calculation was done correctly. Now, we haven't interpreted this lambda. I, I actually gave the interpretation just a second ago by accident, but I don't have the right to because we haven't uh, done the calculation yet. But what I said was that the lambda was the, uh, the average number of events. It's the expected number of events. Uh, and then the r is the actual number of events. So how can we be sure that's true? Well, it's the usual thing. If we have z is equal to um, uh, uh, r equals 0 to infinity, uh, lambda to the r over r factorial, e to the minus lambda. If I differentiate that with respect to, to lambda, well, the z d lambda has to be equal to 0, because lambda, as we just described, is equal to 1. So this will be equal to uh, if I d d lambda of lambda the r is r lambda to the r minus 1 over r factorial e to the minus lambda, uh, r equals 0 uh, to infinity, um, minus, now, uh, d d lambda of e to the minus lambda is equal to minus e to the minus lambda, uh, by the chain rule and the defining property of the exponential that its uh, integral is uh, dif differential of it is itself. So we get minus the sum lambda to the r over r factorial e to the minus lambda. And that thing is just z again, yeah, so it's just equal to 1. But this thing, well, we do the usual trick. It's equal to 1 over lambda, the sum r equals 0 to infinity, r lambda to the r over r factorial e to the minus lambda. And of course, that's just equal to 1 over lambda sum r p of r, uh, uh, which is the expected value of r. And so, um, well, 1 over lambda. And so putting all of that together, we get that um, the expected value of r over lambda is equal to 1. So the expected value of r is equal to lambda. So this lambda has the, um, has the property that, that, well, it is the thing that you might hope it would be, lambda is the expected number of events. Um, sometimes uh, you might have a rate. So if you say that uh, the expected number of events per time is rho, uh, then lambda would be equal to uh, rho times big T. If big T was the, the, the time that, say, the, say if uh, rho was the, uh, the number of fish caught per hour and T was the amount of time that the angler spent fishing, uh, the lambda would be the expected number of events. So the basic object is this lambda. Sometimes when you see the Poisson distribution written down, what you see written down uh, is the, the rho times t. And I should say um, that there are different distributions that are calculated from this uh, for this Poisson process. So uh, the one I've just uh, worked out is like the so-called you know counting uh, uh, distribution. And it's the thing that's usually called the Poisson distribution. But based on the Poisson process, you can also work out the um, the time to wait for the next event, that's the exponential distribution, and then there are other distributions for complicated, more complicated things like the, uh, you know, the 
uh, time to wait for the kth event and so on. That's the gamma distribution. So the, the you know the, this Poisson process is the um, origin of many distributions. This one uh, is interesting. It's one of the most basic or uh, primary uh, distributions related to the Poisson uh, process. Uh, it's very useful. It comes up all the time, and it's a discrete one, so it fits into our collection of uh, discrete distributions. Um, and uh, unlike the binomial distribution we looked at before, it's one that has infinite support. You know, the R ranges from zero to infinity, not as in the case of the bi binomial expansion uh, distribution uh, from, or sorry, ranges from zero to infinity. Um, in the case of the binomial dis uh, distribution, it ranged from zero to some n, where n was the defining parameter. So we've shown, uh, to recap, we've shown that if lambda is the expected number of events, and we have a Poisson process, then the probability of getting exactly r events is equal to um, uh, lambda to the r over r factorial e to the minus lambda. And in a sense, this is about the events happening, the probability that you get r events, and you have to divide out by the order the events happen. And this is about the probability of no other events happening in, in that time. Uh, that's, that's just uh, roughly speaking. Uh, we, you, you could use the same method that we have used in other cases to also work out uh, the variance, and maybe that's something that will uh, be on a problem sheet. Uh, let, let's go back to our, our couple of examples. Um, the first example was the angler. So the angler had lambda is equal to 5. That was the, uh, the expected number of fish. That's the number of fish they typically caught in their angling period. Uh, and we want to know the probability that they catch exactly four fish. So PR of four is equal to, in this case, lambda is five, so it's five to the power of four over four factorial. Um, so just matching these things up, e to the minus five, and uh, just putting those into a calculator, uh, you get 0 0.19. So there's a, a one, about around a one in five chance they'll catch exactly um, four, five, uh, four fish. Uh, let's just do another quick example. Um, in this example, uh, we have um, uh, Batman. Uh, Batman is is defending Gotham, and Gotham is subject to continuous attack by by supervillains. In fact, on a typical night uh, in in Gotham, uh, two two supervillains arrive, and that's fine because Batman can handle two supervillains. In fact, Batman can handle anything up to six supervision supervillains. Uh, if there's more than six, Batman becomes overwhelmed. Uh, he, he's beaten, the supervillains then destroy Gotham, um, and, and that's the end. So uh, we might ask, what's the probability uh, of there being exactly seven supervillains? Uh, this, uh, you'll note, and you might have seen examples of this before, isn't exactly the thing that you're interested in. You want to know the probability of seven or more, uh, and the way to do it would be to calculate all the numbers up to six and then take that from one. But let's just work out the probability that seven supervillains arrive, thereby overwhelming Batman. So. Lambda is 2, 2 to the 7, over 7 factorial, e to the minus 2. Uh, the 2 to the 7 looks like a big number, but you should always note that uh, things over factorials always get overwhelmed by the factorials. If you think of it, it's 2 to the 7, it's 2 by 2, by 2, by 2, that's 4, by 2, that's 5, by 2, that's 6, by 2, that's 7. And we're dividing it by 7 by 6, by 5, by 4, by 3, by 2, by 1. And so you can think of them as sort of being paired off. And so earlier on, yes, the, the twos kind of balance the things on the bottom, but later on the number on the bottom that's paired off with one of the twos is going to be bigger than the two. And it doesn't matter what number this is, if the power is high enough, um, the thing on the bottom uh, overpowers it. Um, that's just a, a, a note from the convergence of the uh, power series expansion of the exponential. But in this case, you can see, indeed, the number is rather low. So on a given night, there's only a 0 0.00. Uh, three four chance uh, of Batman uh, being overwhelmed. So that seems rather good. Um, in, in fact, it, it's, it's kind of bad news because um, if this happens night on night, uh, there are 365 or 366 nights in the year. And if you multiply this number by 365 or 366, you can see that over a year, it's actually quite likely that, uh, that Gotham uh, will fall. So uh, the example is only a silly example. Uh, of course, <laughs> we're not really worried about Gotham, uh, but if we were, it would be bad news. Thank you.